What is up? Are you ready for some more chess talk? We're not going to jump immediately into the Hans Niemann report, even though we're going to get to it in like 30 seconds. Uh, I'll just catch you up basically. So there was this Vice article. So this, this article is about the emails that Maxime Dlugi and Daniel Wrench had back and forth when Maxime was caught cheating in chess.com events. And these emails show Maxime admitting to cheating. He specifically admits to having a student who fed him answers while he was playing in a chess.com event. And he claims outrageously that he did not know the kid was using analysis. Okay, so this was a class, Maxime Dlugi. Now, why are we talking about Maxime Dlugi, right? Who the, who the hell is Maxime Dlugi? I don't have time to know all the grandmasters by name, especially not the Dlugis. Is it Dlugi when you like snort, like snot out of your nose or something? No, okay, so we're talking about Dlugi because he was one of Hans Niemann's coaches and you may remember uh, Magnus mentioning him in an interview, one of the first things he said after pulling out a Sinkefeld. I believe this might have been his first interview in the next tournament. And one of the only things he's willing to say about this situation is to congratulate Hans on his good play and say that his coach, Maxime Dlugi, must be doing a good job. Now, we don't technically know if Hans is working with Dlugi currently. It doesn't matter unless you're trying to prove that uh, Neiman cheated in the Sinkefeld Cup. You know, then I guess you would be like, oh, who's he currently working with? I, I would never, I'm not suspecting him of that. No one with a rational mind is six, is really suspecting Hans of cheating at the Sinkerfeld Cup. Now, I look forward to seeing if chess.com says something different, but that's my understanding. I've listened to several, you know, I've listened to a lot of the content about it, including um, this very good podcast, Perpetual Chess Podcast, that just came out with two different uh, GMs with extremely interesting different perspectives on cheating, including the second one, David Smurden, uh, who has worked with chess.com and uh, with cheating detection and just has a lot of uh, research and specific perspective. The first guy's like a philosopher. It's really interesting. They're super different. Anyways, lots of perspectives. Anyway, so uh, Maxime Glugi, you know, we could look at it. I read the whole article. You can find it. Just, you know, search it. So I didn't really go into this and I'm not going to spend time. I lied about 30 seconds. We were going to go into this, but we'll be in, we'll be here in like a minute or two. I, I, I didn't, I have not read this yet. This is going to be insane. So yeah, they have their, they have the emails between Glugi and Daniel Wrench. Glugi admits to cheating. He is extremely pathetic and does not take accountability in a legitimate way in any way, shape, or form. Daniel Wrench is also not doing a good job. They gave Dlugi way too many chances. I believe they gave him a third try on chess.com. I could be wrong about that. If you look at Maxime Dlugi's emails, though, the most pathetic thing is, look, you see this fucking redacted part? Yeah, that's, but that's because he was providing, providing identifying information about a minor. So chess.com had to redact it. Because this fucking GM asshole who runs some stupid fucking school in New York or some shit thinks it's okay to throw one of his minor students, okay, a child, under the bus because the child was using analysis and Dlugi didn't know that his student was using analysis when feeding him moves. He says the kid's ratings were lower than mine. And to think that he didn't know as a GM that his lower rated student was constantly providing him analysis moves, you can feel that, but I guarantee you he knew that. I can confidently say that, but it doesn't matter because you can feel that and it, it doesn't matter. It's negligence or it's, it's horrible negligence or it's like horrible intention to a level that it doesn't matter. This is how accountability works. Look at how his fucking email ends. This shit makes me mad, yo. I can give you his name if necessary. He, he's talking about the fucking kid but I hope it will just stay between us. I can give you his name. Bro, you are the accountable one. He was a child. How do you not know this? Are you like, okay? Like what's wrong with you? Seriously. And Matt, this all came to light, these emails. So why did chess.com leak these emails? I think it's fair to ask that question. <laughs> they said they did it apparently for like, because of public interest, but that's, you know, that's very strange. I mean, obviously, pu public is interested in a lot of things. People would rather dox children than go to therapy. <laughs>
Therapy is probably a pretty important part of cheat, cheating detection. Okay, Dlugi, Magnus calls him out. Um, Reddit post, oh yeah, this is where I um, learned that Hans Niemann was an uh, ambassador for Play Magnus. So he was uh, essentially worked with Magnus's company very shortly before this all went down. I believe this year. Yeah, er, like earlier this year, he was, he says on this pod, this podcast is unbelievable. I listened to the entire thing and took notes, actually. Now that I get here, I, I remember that I took notes. Do you want to know, do you want to know some of the highlights? It was a very interesting podcast because it was, a, it was Hans when he was 18, so it was a year ago, about a year ago, and um, it was obviously before this all went down. It was also, um, he was, he had become like a 2700 something, so he was very high rated, and they talk about how amazing his rise was. 16 minutes in, Han says it's impossible that he's going to fail. He says it's impossible that I would ever fail. So it's just interesting to get an insight into his psychology. Like, there aren't a lot of chess players necessarily with that sort of psychology. Like, that he, lit he literally said, here, 1635. And I'm investing every second of every day into improving my chess. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I just, I just think that it's impossible for me to, to not reach what I'm achieving now with, with how I'm working and the opportunities that I'm getting and the support of the Magnus Group. And, you know, all this, I think, is just um, manifesting into, into just um, chess success. It's just going to take some time and hard work for that, too. Oh, and just to be clear, I, I assume this is obvious. I'm not implying him saying that it's impossible he's going to fail has anything to do with cheating. Or, or, well, no, I'm not saying it has anything to do with cheating. I'm, I'm saying it's like a, an interesting psychological thing to have that mindset. Um, he mentions not having had a coach for four years, which was really interesting. And then he got a coach. So he talks about that a little. The team that I have surrounding me from a trust perspective um, with a coach, um, seconds, training partners, strong players supporting me, motivating me. Um, I think that I've been able to sort of go from not having a coach for four years to having a, a team uh, that's really ensuring uh, that, that that improvement is happening. And I don't know that he's talking about Maxime Dlugi, um, but he does mention Maxime Dlugi in this podcast, and that was why I wanted to listen to it. It was a nice experience. So there's always some, it was very chill, relaxed. You know, it wasn't really like, you know, your traditional Soviet intense training. But right. It was always a fun, fun experience and just chilling and, and, and enjoying uh, the game of chess. And then in New York, you got the opportunity to work with uh, Grandmaster Max Lugi some, right? Yeah, that was actually, uh, it was more in, um, it was started remotely in, in California and then some in-person lessons uh, in, in New York as well. And I'm guessing a different teaching style than, than Walter Brown? Yeah, definitely a different teaching style. Uh, he sort of let, laid the groundworks for my positional understanding. A lot of, you know, we, um, he, he laid the groundworks for a lot of my style. Um, again, another blitz specialist, yeah. really based on intuition. So I think I got a great blitz foundation and just got a great like intuitive chess foundation uh, from a very young age. I don't think we heard, but actually earlier when they were talking about the coaches, there was this moment. Uh, that, that, that improvement is happening. And are you able to say who you're working with? No, I wouldn't. I don't really want to share that, but uh, they're, they're, my training partners are all very, very strong players who uh, I am very happy to be working with. So anyways, let's just, let's just, maybe I'll talk more about that podcast later. Yeah, so this, you know, this whole chess.com report comes after like a week of, you know, they were, the CEO was in these Reddit threads being like, we're working on something like, I don't know why they do things that way, but I get it. They're doing their best. I guess that, I guess this is, you know, I guess that's how they do it. It's whatever. Um, oh, there's also this interesting chess clip. We'll probably talk about this another time. But yeah, this game was very interesting, and I found their chatter very interesting. And at one point, no, 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 yes, yes, no, no, no. Well, look, at least you see that I have threads, right? You know, this is something to be proud of that you can understand such a. It's a great capacity. I'm indeed very proud. Great opacity. So just to be clear, he he's negging her. Negging is when you like are mean to someone to try to like be cute or something. And I know that's her thing. She like she negs people too. So it's like I'm not saying it's necessarily like bad in this context but like i i watch it thinking like why is he doing that but anyways they have this moment right after capacity or a great great what a great capacity oh, capacity capacity okay. to be seeing your opponent's threats <laughs> okay that is a very interesting uh, choice of words there 
So he takes that as her acute, like saying, I know that everybody says you've cheated. So he at first thinks she says opacity instead of capacity, which is really funny also. Because opacity sort of suggests like translucence in a sense. And it's weird that he takes it as a reference to cheating because she's making a comment that he sees his opponent's positions, which is just a strange way to represent what would be cheating um, in chess. Like that's, you know. So it's funny that he takes even something like that as a reference to cheating when it's just someone saying, oh, you can see your opponent's positions. But I don't know. I'm sure, you know, the context is he knows that she knows that he's been, he's been caught cheating. He's admitted to cheating. Okay, so today, with all that, you know, and a bag of chips, and everything's been happening, now a whole ass fucking report, not ass fucking, but a whole ass fucking report comes out. Chess.com drops their fucking new album, and I have to say, 72 pages seems like a lot. Okay, a lot of them are exhibits, I guess. Wait, how long is the actual words? 21 pages. I guess it's a little bit better when I think of it as 20 pages. Like, that's that's actually not that bad. And then the rest is, like, them having evidence for what they're saying. Okay, I'm just going to read it for a second. Over the last few weeks, the world has been following the major story regarding Hans Niemann, Magnus Carlsen, and cheating in chess. Th wow, how many spaces do you put after a period? Bro, such boomers working at chess.com. Like, come on. One space is fine. We don't need, like, th three? I mean, I've heard two, but three? This has become a matter of significant public interest, both inside and outside the chess world, and we present in this report our exploration of the event circumstances, data, and data that have informed chess.com's decisions concerning the current controversy, as well as the issue of cheating in chess more generally. I do have to say, I think it's an overall good thing for a company to be thorough, and the fact that they've made us wait a month or so is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, as soon as Hans started saying what he said in the interviews at the Sinkerfeld Cup about chess.com, he was very explicit. And I said in my first video on this, like, yeah, it was obviously unprofessional for him to reference private conversations with Daniel Wrench in an interview. That was not a good call. And I'm sure he can improve in terms of how he interacts with, um, you know, media uh, in the future in his career. Okay, let's keep reading. At the outset, we want to make clear that while these events highlight a critical topic in chess, cheating, the vast majority of chess games do not involve any cheating. We estimate that fewer than 0.14%, okay, that still seems like kind of a lot, of players on chess.com ever cheat. So that's one, uh, that's 14 out of a, is that 14 out of 10,000? If you actually listen to Hans when he admitted he cheated, he clearly stated I cheated to be able to fight stronger players so I can learn. Obviously, he cheated more than once because if there are stronger players, he wouldn't be able to stay at that range. That's an extremely good uh, point, Mr. Fred. The other big problem with that comment is it's a clear rationalization. And it's, it's okay. Like, I'm not trying to demonize or pick apart Hans. Like, at the end of the day, he's a public figure and he is an adult. I think it's okay to talk about him. But, like, it does feel weird because... He's not the only fucking person, and he's admitted to cheating, and that's good, and I believe people are capable of change. I'm sure he's been reflecting a lot on his behavior. These are the consequences of his actions that he's encountering. Also, the consequences of some bad decisions of Magnus, and uh, maybe other people. We present evidence in this report that Hans likely cheated online much more than his public statements suggest. However, while Hans has had a record-setting and remarkable rise in rating and strength... I'm sorry, that is a well-written sentence. The R alliteration is really tight. Good job, Daniel. However, while Hans has had a record-setting and remarkable rise in rating and strength, in our view, there is a lack of concrete statistical evidence that he cheated in his game with Magnus or in any other over-the-board uh, games. Good. Good for them. Uh, and good for Hans. I mean, obviously, yeah. Uh, as we were talking about in the previous stream, cheating over the board does take, like, in some ways more effort. So you could say it's worse. You could say it even says more about somebody that they would cheat over the board in the sense that it takes more effort. Now, how much should that really determine a difference in punishment is obviously debatable. We were never pressured by Magnus or his team whatsoever to remove Hans from chess.com or revoke his invitation to the chess.com global championship. Ah, okay, do we believe him? 
nor did we communicate with Magnus regarding our decisions on these issues before we made them. In fact, Magnus did not even know we were going to remove Hans until Hans went public with our private correspondence. I mean, it does make sense that they wouldn't want to involve Magnus. It's a very clear conflict of interest. They, it would have to be a very stupid business decision. But what does that really mean? I don't know. We uninvited Hans from our upcoming major online event and revoked his access to our site based on our experience with him in the past, growing suspicions among top players and our team about his rapid rise of play, the strange circumstances and explanations of his win over Magnus, as well as Magnus's unprecedented withdrawal. In order to have more time to investigate the OTB situation and our own internal concerns, we uninvited Hans from our event and prevented his access to Chess.com. Now, before I even finish the paragraph, you could argue that that's not a good decision. I mean, you could say that Chess.com shouldn't have done that. That they shouldn't have. That the damage to Hans of removing him was not worth it. You know, all they got to do is have more time to sort of think. But, you know, meanwhile, they're tarnishing this 19-year-old's reputation. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, legally, obviously, they're allowed to do it. Morally... Why, why not assume innocence? Like, aren't you supposed to assume innocence? That being said, I haven't read the evidence yet. We are open to continuing a dialogue with Hans to discuss his status on chess.com. We believe that chess organizers, federations, companies, and players can all work together more effectively to create great and assuredly fair chess events. The mission of chess.com. Since the founding of chess.com, since the dawn of man, um, our mission has always remained the same, to grow the game of chess and to help people enjoy their lives through playing, learning, and watching chess. We remain committed to that mission through the products, content, and events that we continue to produce. We aren't just a business. We are passionate fans of the game, and we have spent years working to serve the needs of the chess community. We feel a deep sense of responsibility to act as trustworthy stewards of the game. For the nearly 100 million members who have signed up, the 20 million... Okay, this is just like an advertisement. We understand it's been disappointing. We've tried to act in line with our mission. We could have made several better moves, and we hope that we learned a lot in this process. Okay, fair. Uh, you could be more specific, but okay. September 4th, Magnus with white pieces, Hans with black pieces, play. Hans gives a post-game interview. Magnus tweets his withdrawal from the event, linking to a video in which soccer manager... Yeah, yeah. Chess.com uh, emails Hans privately to let him know his account had been discreetly closed and his invitation to the CGC had been withdrawn. A copy of this email is attached as Exhibit A. So we have to go down to that now. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure. Hold on, wait. What's the sequence of events? So, so he, he beat Magnus at the Singapore Cup. He gives a post-game interview. Magnus retreats. How did that sequence of events, them deciding Hans is not allowed to the event right after he beat Magnus. How does that not have to do with Magnus? And right after Magnus withdraws, they uninvite Hans, but they're saying it doesn't have to do with Magnus. Okay, let's check that out. So it's just a coincidence. Let's check this out. Chess.com has elected to privately remove access from your account on Chess.com, and we are rescinding the invitation to join the CGC per your qualified spot. Chess.com retains the right to close or remove access to any account at any time without explanation. We will have, yeah, pretty much every website or company has that right which honestly is kind of fucked like why is that just the way things work that's a little bizarre honestly i don't i don't really get why i think it's like an american thing like consumer rights have been totally eroded companies just run the government and governments run the companies so it's fair in that way we will however be providing you with your full compensation of five thousand us dollars for the qualified spot in the cdc you can claim your prize here this is a very bad email how do they send this email to him right after he beats Magnus and not say why it is and that it has nothing to do with him beating Magnus? Of course he's going to think it has to do with him beating Magnus. This is absurd. Their company buys play Magnus and then some, a 19-year-old beats Magnus. Magnus withdraws, publicly insinuates that uh, there's something he can't say. And then Chess.com, the company that just bought Magnus's company, now uninvites Hans to a major tournament. With no fucking explanation. I'm sorry, there's no explanation here except we can, we're allowed to. That's absurd. I'm looking, looking forward to hearing any justifications here. Um, so then, okay, so they email him. Hans publicly addresses the ban the next day, um, stating that although he cheated a few years ago when he was 12 and 16, he never cheated in a tournament with prize money or when he was streaming or in a real game. Oh, shit. 
Uh, the fact that they quoted that is not a good sign for Hans. Okay, so then two days later, Chess.com sends Han a per letter personally laying out the reasons for the decisions to revoke his status on Chess.com and to disinvite him from the CDC. Oh, you thought that was a good idea? Three days after you initially uninvited him? Yeah. Oh, fuck, we forgot to give a reason. This is like the I think you should leave sketch where the guy's like, I should have just, I should have said there was a reason that I couldn't pay for the bill. They responded to him in an email, which we're going to read in a second. Then they did the public response, which we already looked at it, like, you know, in previous streams where they said, uh, you know, that they think he cheated more than he said. And that was their public statement. So their private statement was, Dear Hans, I'm sending this letter with three important goals. To clarify factual inaccuracies in the statements you've recently made regarding your fair play violations on chess.com, to justify my reason for withdrawing our invitation to chess.com prize events, including the upcoming chess.com global championship, and to talk about a path back to chess.com events. First, regarding the comments you made concerning when and why you cheated on chess.com. In your interview, you mentioned paraphrased that you cheated when you were 12 and then later when you were 16 in an unrated game. This directly contradicts our statistical evidence as well as... Uh, as well as the conversation you and I had in our private call when you confessed to cheating, and there is written evidence from you that substantially corroborates this. You also contradicted your own statement that you had only cheated in unrated games in the interview by later stating that you did it to gain rating points, which obviously indicates cheating in rated games. I believe I said that exact same thing uh, two videos ago. I might have just thought it, but I believe I made that exact same comment. I, I do want to say I it doesn't give me I'm not getting pleasure from this exactly like I find it interesting but this is not like schadenfreude like I'm not enjoying Hans's suffering this is actually like sad to me you know I made mistakes when I was like a young person I don't think Hans is a bad person I, I don't I'm not you know I don't mean to take any pleasure in him facing consequences in such a harsh and public way I mean, if only we all got called out like this on our bad behaviors when we were 19, um, it would, the world would probably be a better place. And it's, it's tough that Hans is taking the brunt of it here. I'm not going over this stuff because I enjoy it. I'm a huge chess fan, and I want to give my perspective on this very public situation. As you indicated in your interview, chess.com has the best fair play detection in the world. Oof, that's a fucking bomb to drop. Using that system, we have identified many clear instances of cheating. So the whole thing with cheating, a lot of GMs talk about this, like, it's hard to prove when you're talking about, you know, we're not talking about catching someone cheating. Like, we're talking about, or like, we're not talking about physically catching them cheating. You know what I mean? So, like, actually detecting it through statistical methods, it's statistics. You never prove anything. You just indicate it strongly beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know exactly what that fucking statistical value is. And I bet they'll explain. While there are other potential events, games, and evidence that reinforce the untruth of your public claims, specifically for the purpose of this letter, we are informing you that some of our strongest data suggests you violated fair play on the following dates. Title Tuesday qualifier, July 7th, 2015. I believe it was a Title Tuesday that Maxime Dlugi cheated in. Yep. It was a titled Tuesday that Maxime Dlugi cheated in. Chess.com says they have evidence of Hans cheating in April 2017 in a titled Tuesday. And Maxime says he cheated a few months before August 2017. April is four months before August. Or four, it's almost five months when you look at the specific date. I'm not saying that that means anything. But that's certainly something that my brain notices. You know, was Hans a student of... Maxime, yes, he, he, he said he was on this podcast. Maxime has admitted to cheating. Um, they have both been caught. According to chess.com, they both cheated around the same time in 2017. It would also make sense if that's when they worked together. He didn't say when they worked together, but it sounded like it was in the past on this uh, podcast a year ago. So 2017 would be a fair guess. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm fucking... Charlie Day at the chalkboard. Okay, so a title Tuesday of particular note in this event. So this is 2015. So Hans is only 12. This is the one in, when he was 12. Of particular note in this event is that you played against and lost to someone we eventually closed for cheating in that very same event. And that your game reflected clear engine versus engine play. 
That's fucking crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just kind of blows my mind. Like, they detected engine versus engine play. Do you think they're talking about Maxime Gluge when they say someone they eventually closed? Hold on, let me look it up. July 7th, 2015, Title Tuesday. Title Tuesday qualifier? You're right, that's probably not going to be here. July 7th, 2015. So this is the date. Oh, Delugi! Delugi was in this tournament. Hans. Hans Cool Neiman. Hans was here. Now, did they play each other? So, okay, well, let's just do this. Oh, wait, we can just do that. My bad. I didn't realize they did this. No, he didn't play Delugi. Unless it's, like, not here, he didn't play Delugi. Well, they did say it was a qualifier. I should look for qualifier. I'm supposed to find... What even is a qualifier? I don't even watch Title Tuesday. Why do they have qualifiers? Okay, whatever. You know, the point is, Maxime... Actually, that I already proved my point. That's a good question. Can I check if any of the other players' accounts are closed? Hold on. Let's see if any of... No. Uh, they're fine. That's a national master. This is a... Frickin' master. This is a imaginary master. This is GM Hess. We all know GM Hess. Nothing wrong with Robert Hess. He's one of the best. National master. Oh, account closed. It's this person. It has to be, right? There's no way. He... Oh, wait, no. He lost to someone that they closed for cheating. But Hans won this game. Wow, the plot thickens. So anyways, let's keep reading. In addition to all these uh, games where they say there's statistical information indicating a significant likelihood suggesting that he violated fair play policies, um, they move on to say, in addition to the direct monetary benefit that a top standing and prize position in those events would earn you, the rating points gained were significantly beneficial to you, as you admitted to me in our call where you confessed that quote. Having a higher rating would mean people tune in more to my streams when I'm battling Hikaru, Danya, or Eric Hansen. Not sure what that's supposed to be significant of, but okay. I need people to believe that I'm a worthy rival to follow and subscribe. Bro, come on, man. You gotta move past these types of rationalizations at a certain point. You just gotta understand you just fucked up. He's gonna come out and speak soon, and... I hope he does a good job. I think he will, and yeah. From the perspective of chess.com, if you think it's likely he would cheat, it's even better to let him do that than the shittiness of preventing him from coming to an event and banning his account on the site at the same time when he just won against the guy whose company you bought. On that note, there were several matches during the year 2020 in which you farmed your fellow chess peers for higher ratings. Specifically, the following matches feature blatant cheating throughout. Wow. Even versus Daniel Naroditsky? When they say farm, do they mean that the other people knew about it? No. Playing under Jan Napomniachi? Jan Napomniachi playing under an anonymous account? So did Hans know? Wow. We're preparing to present stati strong statistical evidence that confirm each of those cases above, as well as clear toggling versus non-toggling evidence, where you perform much better while toggling to a different screen during your moves. So chess.com has the technology to do tell when people are going to another screen and toggling. I think they also have ways of detecting um, mouse movements to try to understand if the mouse movements indicate someone going to another screen. Uh, that's my impression. And it seems to me that they also might, if they have a webcam, they might have technology for eye, judging eye movements. That's, th this is information I recently sort of heard speculated, uh, which I think makes sense. Moving on to my second point, I want to address both the reasons and timing for freezing your account and rescinding your CGC invite. Okay, so I've been criticizing him for this. Let's see what they say. When I received your confession back on August 12th of 2020, that's significant. In light of your age, I allowed you to create a new account with no fair play markings to continue to stream chess. That is such a dumb fucking idea, chess.com. Are you fucking kidding me? What is wrong with your fucking policies? You need to, like, prevent someone from using your platform for, like, a year if they cheat. Minimum. How do you expect someone to learn anything if you provide no consequences at all? He gets to create another account on your site because you're so desperate for people to be using your site. 
You'll remember that I worked hard to both advise you on this process and to protect you as much as I could. I would do that again for you or any young player I deemed to have lost their way and wanted to choose a better path forward. For my team, however, there always remained serious there always remained serious concerns about how rampant your cheating was in prize events. As you know, we've closed the accounts of hundreds of titled players, including four of the top 100 grandmasters who have confessed to cheating. Are they saying... Four of the top 100 grandmasters have confessed to cheating? That's a lot of top grandmasters to confess to cheating, y'all. And we carefully monitor and help all of them as they rehabilitate into participating in our events. You and I had many subsequent discussions in our Slack DMs where we openly cooperated on the right way for you to rebuild your reputation. In finalizing the field for the upcoming CGC and based on a growing concern regarding ensuring fair play in Chess.com's first million dollar prize event, my team did a deep review of your past history and encouraged me to rethink my position of letting you continue to play in prize events on chess.com. I ultimately made the decision that too much was at stake given our ongoing suspicions and past violations. He has not addressed the timing yet. He has not addressed the timing. Considering the above, we made the decision to close your account privately and uninvite you from the CDC. I regret the timing. <laughs> what? The fake news media is trying to arrest me. Um, I regret the timing, but the timing between the Sinkefeld Cup and the CGC required me to move quickly to replace our, your spot. Right when Magnus fucking insinuates Hans cheated, you don't do it. It's not the time. You wait. I mean, I guess, I, okay, okay. I need, to, I need to rethink what I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, once Magnus has insinuated Hans cheated, it's already too late for chess.com. Whether they do it in, a, in the next day like they did, or in a week, or in a month, which they didn't have that amount of time. I don't know when this event takes place, but they didn't quite have the choice to wait. But they must be pretty mad at Magnus, because they should have done it before Magnus did anything. Which is, there was a period of over six months where Hans did not play any prize money terms on chess.com. That is the one thing that I'm going to say, and that is the only thing that I'm going to say on this topic. Yeah, I mean, Hikaru has the right to say that. I mean, it's like, you have to understand, like, all this talk, all this drama, it really will decrease once Hans takes genuine accountability. I truly know that. You just have to, like, really take accountability. Like, really understand just how bad what you did was. And just stop making it about yourself. Just like we talk about with Better Call Saul. The interesting thing about this podcast you did, The Perpetual Chess, there were a lot of extremely interesting and psychologically fascinating uh, aspects of it. For example, he says this. It's funny that I said that then, right? But, but now when I think about that, I just think uh, I would have been such an idiot to go to Harvard. You know, have, uh... <laughs> Harvard was the only college he applied to. Like, I just think that um, if I went to Harvard, I would really... Uh, uh, I think me being rejected from Harvard is single-handedly the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I thank them for wrongly rejecting me because I know I'm just too good for their school. <laughs> and, and I really am not trying to laugh at Hans for this. It's, it's okay, man. That's an interesting, like, psychology to have, like, to say, like, I only would want to go to the top university in the country. And, um, you know, he's probably right that maybe not getting in was a good thing. I totally think that's valid for him. Like, he's pursuing an extremely awesome career with chess, and I honestly wish him the best. And at the same time, it's like, it's always this defensiveness and having to prove myself. For example, I found this really interesting point where they're talking about Bobby Fischer, and Hans is asked about, like, he, he sort of compares himself to Bo Bobby Fischer in, in a certain way. And the interviewer says, like, yeah, but, you know, Bobby Fischer's way of life was less than ideal, basically, and, and we hear this. Well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> there are a lot of things you could be doing, as we just but, discussed. But if you could tell me, uh, but I, I don't know, but I just don't find enjoyment of those things. I just find no reason to, 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 to uh, I think you can just, uh, just look at how Fischer lives his life before insanity, and I think that's uh, the right way to do it, right? I mean, I that, he's not I a think, great role model in a lot of respects, you know? Well, yeah, he's not a good role. Uh, yeah, but uh, his chess 
before you know things went uh, haywire, um, the way that he approached the game was is absolutely inspiring, right? Like, yeah, but from like an adult perspective, like to say like before someone went insane, uh, or before someone's life got really bad. Um, and the way they affected other people got really bad. Like before they got really bad, everything was going great. Like that's just not rational. And the interviewer tries to like sort of point this out. The way that he approached the game was, is absolutely inspiring, right? Like he would, he was working entirely alone. I think it's easier to work alone now, but he was working entirely alone. His, he had a, he was working, he had a set regimen. He was in great physical shape. He had no romance, no distractions, you know. He was totally focused. And, you know, it paid dividends, right? It did. But, I mean, would you take his life? If you, if you could say you can have Fisher's whole life, w- would you take it? Well, uh, I've been, uh, I'll answer that question with, with another question and a response to that question. So someone once asked me, you know, uh, in a very stupid manner, they said, uh, are you the next... Um, you could just get anyone, right? You could say, are you the next Hikaru Nakamura? Are you the next uh, Magnus Carlsen? I say, I'm, 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 Hans ne- I'm the next Hans Niemann, right? I think that's how I'll, I'll answer that that, uh, that question. Yeah, I mean, but it's just Fisher was so unbalanced and obviously he paid tremendous consequences. I'm just saying like... Well, yeah, I would say that the imbalance... You know, I, I'm quite a Fisher esper- expert myself and uh, I think the imbalance came from from external factors. I don't think it came from his... Chess actually was something that that um, uh, minimized his external problems. So Hans goes on to show, like, he really is an expert in, like, understanding Bobby Fischer's life and knows stuff, like, I definitely had never even heard of. Um, but this is interesting to me because, like, no one's saying exactly that, like, chess caused Bobby Fischer to lose his mind and become a, like, fucking, like, shitty guy. Like, that's not what was being talked about. What was being talked about was, like, did his lifestyle cause him to be a sort of fucked up shitty guy? Or, like, did his lifestyle influence the, you know, struggles he had with being a non-shitty guy? So, like, moving on to the question of, like, did chess make him go insane? Like, no, of course chess didn't. Yeah. That's not how sanity works. And and so the obsessive focus on chess and chess alone is not super healthy. It also feels like it, it feels like a little bit of a lie. And it's like, why are you lying? Like, none of us do that. Like, you don't have to pretend that, dude. I I don't work super hard. I work enough to pay my bills and live and maybe save a little. But it's okay. Like, you you don't have to. But anyways, this brings us to one of the last things we'll show from this podcast, which is when he responds to the question about, does he ever bring it down a notch? Does he ever think about, like, not working so hard? Uh, They call the chapter, has Hans considered a less intense approach to chess? So check this out. But it seems kind of like you're you're pointing things, you're painting things rather, sorry, sort of black and white. Like you mentioned, like trying to avoid romantic relationships and don't want to do any partying, doing 12 hours a day. But do you ever think like I could do nine hours a day and like, you know, ha- have someone to lean on and like have a little bit of fun? Like, do you think about well, like just bringing it down a notch or two? So what do you think he's going to say or... If I was gonna, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If Hans is about to bring up a musician or a, a musical artist, which musical artist is Hans about to bring up? Hmm. No, I don't. Because, um, uh, let, you know, let's just look at, uh, let's talk about Kanye. How familiar are you with Kanye? Mr. I mean, I. I've, I'm halfway through the Netflix documentary. Okay, great. Amazing, 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 amazing. <laughs> We're going to reference Kanye's Netflix documentary here, okay? Yeah, it's called Gen- Genius. And I yes. guess just to give any non-listeners a bit of context, or maybe Hans, you want to, but obviously kind of a tortured soul, but knew he was going to be successful from a young age. Go go ahead, Hans. So, you know, obviously, I guess I, comparing myself to people who have since gone into a uh, mental, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. it's not the, from a theoretical, like this might not be the best look. However, I really, it's moments like that, that really, really make me like Hans. I'm not joking. Like, I, I think he's like totally capable of like really good self-awareness and self-criticism. And I, I think he seems like a, probably a good guy. Like he just needs to work through some problems. Like it happens. 
But he's being honest. He's being honest about who his role models are. It's not about the mental health side of it as much as like the, just like the public facing need to, you know, present as like larger than life, basically. Um, And I actually vaguely thought of Kanye when Hans made the earlier comment about like how it's impossible that he's going to fail because uh, I don't think that's a Kanye line. I think it's actually a Chance the Rapper line where he goes, I met Kanye West. I'm never going to fail. Like, it just reminded me of that. And, you know, a lot of Kanye's music and his attitude, which I, I like a lot of Kanye's music. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of his public statements. I mean, I'm recording this. I believe yesterday he was photographed in a White Lives Matter shirt. I mean, I don't really, I don't even know what to say anymore. It's like, okay, man, like, cool. Like, he's co-opted by, um, like, Republican parties. Kanye West's independent campaign was secretly run by GOP elites, and there's proof. Um, so anyways, it's just interesting that Hans would, like, look up to someone like that, because, um, not that Hans is co-opted by GOP elites, but someone like Kanye presents as, like, larger than life, but, you know, he's really just a human being, and I, I used to look up to people who did that. I can be really honest about that here. Um, Actually, I wasn't planning to go in this direction, but here are two books I have by Salvador Dali. I used to look up to Salvador Dali. He was my favorite megalomaniac. He, which is not a really common (laughs) mental health term anymore. I've literally never heard really anyone say it, but I don't mean it in a mental health way, and I don't mean it as a diagnosis, and I certainly am not calling Hans a megalomaniac. I'm talking about relating to looking up to a megalomaniac. Sometimes when you're like looking for your own identity, you are attracted to people who have just like asserted this like profoundly individualistic and like um, ambitious sense of identity on the world. And you say like, that's what I want to do. Like I want to be super eccentric and like myself and so on. But you know, there are just a lot of different ways to do that. And um, some role models are better than others. So I don't really look up to Salvador Dali anymore. Um, for a variety of reasons, um, but, you know, I still enjoy his paintings, and I still enjoy Kanye's music, so most of the time. <laughs> Let us keep reading this Chess.com manifesto. We're now reading the letter they sent to him, of course, to explain why they banned him from the event and canceled his Chess.com account, okay? And we were reading it a while ago, and now we're coming back to it. It's full circle. I believe I acted in the best interest of the game and all participants to reconsider our invitation with so much at stake, okay? I'm going to bring my letter to a close with an offer to have a call. If you are willing to correct the false statements you made about having never cheated when it mattered, now that you have said these untruths publicly, acknowledge the full breadth of the above violations and cooperate with us to compete under strict fair play measures Chess.com would be happy to consider bringing you back to our events. In fact, I think it would be a wonderful redemption story for the full truth to come out. For the chess world to see this and acknowledge your talent regardless of your past and give the community what they deserve, the truth. I look forward to talking more. Sincerely, Danny, Chess.com. Well, this is what I've said the whole time. Hans, just say how many games you cheated in and explain how you did it and take accountability and understand what it caused and it's not over for you it's not it's not the end of the world no one wants to cancel hans he seems fine i want him to play okay well that's very interesting to read exhibit b so that was uh here okay september 8th and then they responded in public with this just a very brief paragraph version of that letter then as we remember just last week or so magnus releases a public statement explaining the unprecedented professional decision to withdraw from the singapore cup this was his long sort of twitter you know his, his statement that he finally came out with we went over this uh on a previous stream of course and then we get to part three the, the basis of our decision to remove hans from chess.com and withdraw his cgc invitation Given the significant public interest in the action of Chess.com and various questions within the chess community about the motivations behind our actions with regard to Hans, we believe it is important to answer the following questions at the outset. Did Magnus tell us to close Hans' account on Chess.com and or revoke his invite to the CGC? No. Magnus did not ask us to close Hans' account or to rescind his invitation to the CGC. In fact, Magnus did not have any prior awareness of our decisions on either of those issues. 
Furthermore, we want to clarify that nobody asked us to remove Hans from the CGC. Not Magnus, not Hikaru, not any other titled player. However, numerous top players participating in our events have expressed private concern over Hans competing in our events for some time, and many directly questioned how we were going to ensure fair play in the CGC. Magnus, like the rest of the world, found out about our decisions when Hans made those decisions public in his statements to the press on September 6, 2022. We communicated with Hans privately that we were closing his Chess.com account and rescinded his invitation to the CGC as we went over. As shown in Exhibit A, we also informed Hans that while he would not be able to play in the event, we would pay him the baseline prize money. Okay, dude, it doesn't matter. He has not yet collected. Okay, maybe that's not really relevant. We intended to handle everything discreetly. Hans like, yeah, we know, dude. <laughs> that's not the point. Don't go back to that. Does Chess.com believe that Hans cheated in his September 4th over the board game against Magnus at the Singfield Cup? And do we believe that Magnus has cheated in OTB games? Um, in our view, there is no direct evidence that proves Hans cheated in that game with Magnus or proves he's cheated in other OTB games. That said, as set forth, uh, we believe certain aspects of the September 4th game were suspicious and... Okay. What? And Hans' explanation of his win post-event... Yeah, it was strange that he referenced... Uh, a game between Magnus and Wesley, so that never existed in a tournament they were never at. That was strange, but I don't believe that means much, necessarily. Um, as to his OTB, okay, I, there, there's nothing. As to his OTB play more generally, in section 7 below, we discuss what we believe are apparent anomalies in Hans's rise in OTB rating. Of note, we discuss how Hans became the fastest rising top player in classic, classical OTB chess, in modern recorded history, much later in life than his peers and did it after we had removed him from playing our site in 2020. Holy shit. You know, one last quote from that podcast that I want to show y'all. This is an interesting fact about Hans. As a teen, and maybe even preteen, by the way, we should mention for listeners, you started chess at eight, which again, for, for your level, like... It, it hurts my heart a little to say it, but that's kind of a late start. Um, it is, it is. <laughs> um, so Hans started chess when he was eight, which is a very late start for chess. That's that's really interesting. And he says in that uh, interview that he did like other, he you know, he did a lot of different competitive stuff. I forget exactly what he did. Um, just different sports or competitive stuff. Okay, so we did go over Hans's OTB rating rise and how it was 180 rating points uh, over 14 months, which was wild because Magnus had gone those same 180 rating points uh, from 2460 to 2640. It took Magnus two and a half years to go those ratings, and Hans did it in 14 months. So that was pretty crazy, but... You know, that's not evidence in and of itself. Okay, so he did that rapid rise after Chess.com removed him from their site in 2020. Is that significant? What do we think? Despite these potential suspicions, as shown below in section, uh, whatever, an in-depth review of Hans's over-the-board games using Chess.com statistical methods revealed aggregate patterns of play that, while interesting, are possible for a rising player approaching 2,700. In section 9, we present Hans's top performing events based on his overperformance in strength and rating. We are prepared to cooperate with FIDE and respect their role in leading this and any future over-the-board investigations. Yeah, you should always be cooperating, bro. And they should be cooperating too, and everybody should just be cooperating. If Chess.com was not certain that Hans cheated at the Singapore Cup, why did we take steps to revoke his invitation to the CGC and close his Chess.com account in the wake of his match with Magnus. So this is what I've been saying. This is the critical point. We based this decision on several factors. First, as detailed in this report, Hans admitted to cheating in chess games on our site as recently as 2020 after our cheating detection software and team uncovered suspicious play. Second, we had suspicions about Hans's play against Magnus at the Sinkefeld Cup, which were intensified by the public fallout from the event. Third, we had concerns about the steep, inconsistent rise in Hans's rank set out in section seven of this report. Oh my God, I don't, I don't think I can go over all of this now, y'all. We recognize the timing of these decisions was not ideal, but we had very few days to find a replacement participant in the CGC. 
<sighs> okay, so they say it was because of the public fallout. So not Magnus. Maybe it's like Hikaru, what he said, or what other people said. I mean, whatever. They came to their decision based on what people were saying, and I guess they're allowed to do that, but it made them look bad, and it was bad timing. They did it to the insure, ensure the integrity of their tournament, though. That's a $1 million prize. I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess that's pretty important. <laughs> You're basically stealing a million dollars if you cheat in the tournament. It's like theft of a million dollars. Okay, so they did it to ensure the integrity of their event. They go into specific details on his statements in the interview and how they contradict. Oh my God, so many games they think he cheated in. Nine games in one event? Ten games? They think he cheated so much in these events, not in just like one or two games. Overall, we have found Hans has likely cheated in more than 100 online chess games, including several prize money events. He was already 17 when he likely cheated in some of these matches and games. He was also streaming in 25 of these games. Wow. So the bomb has been dropped and they even have like private conversations. They quote Hans again that chess.com has the best cheat detection in the world. That's pretty fucking cheeky to quote that multiple times. Yeah, okay, they quote a lot of top players saying how much cheating could be a problem and how easy it could be. They explain their sort of method. They, they go into his OTB rise. I, I, this, at a certain point, it's like, oh, it's comparing to other players. I got you, I got you. So Hans Niemann gained more ELO in first almost three years after 2465 than even Ali Reza, Magnus, is that Jeffrey Zhang, Abdi Satarov? I, I don't really get why chess.com is putting themselves out there like this. What, why, like, I like this data, but it, it feels wrong. I, I almost feel like I'm, like, watching something I, like, shouldn't be watching or something. I don't know. It just feels weird to... The context of this document is so, like, fraught. Okay, so basically here, which, which line is Hans? The pink one. Oh, my God. Holy crap. I mean, Hans is just, he reaches 2,700 in like a year and a half. And it takes like fucking Ali Reza another six months. It takes, uh, what is that? Magnus Carlsen? Is that Magnus? It takes him another like year. You know, it takes Esipenko, who's like another prodigy, like fucking two and a half years more. Like that's, Interesting. Time between achieving 2,500 ELO and 2,700 ELO or P reading. Okay, I, I, you know what? I, I've decided this is bad for chess.com. They should not have done this. I don't, I, this is just like publicly available information that it's strange for them to reveal. Like they're, they're not even revealing information here. They're just like, hey, we, we took it upon ourselves to like create graphs that show how likely it is Hans cheated. Like, you don't need to say that. Just say you have your way of detecting his cheating in games on your platform. You don't need to take this extra step. They say his plateaus are unbecoming of a normal chess prodigy. Basically, they went through his claims and they proved they were wrong. He cheated in more games. He cheated in events. He cheated in money events. He cheated while streaming. According to them. I, I, I'm not saying that. They're saying according to what they did. And I didn't go into their statistical method, but do you really want to? I mean, it's like they have some strength. It's called like their chess strength core, like score or whatever. Chess.com strength score, which is footnote 12. See section below titled chess.com best in chess. Okay. To effectively identify the vast majority of cheating, chess.com computes an aggregate strength score. Strength score is a measurement of the similarity between the moves made by the player and the moves suggested as strongest moves by the chess engine. In a sense, it is a measure of the accuracy of play. The longer the chess game time control, uh, the higher the strength score would be as expected to be, since players with more time will be able to evaluate each position more deeply and carefully. Um, it ranges from 0 to 150, um, and 100 is about the highest they've measured for human chess players that can be achieved over a several game span. And 90 is the highest score we've seen the top players sustain over time in classical chess time controls. Pure engine usage alone would typically show scores between 125 and 150, depending on time, device, engine depth, etc. When he admitted to cheating on chess.com in 2020, Hans had a IM title with 
at least one GM norm, and the performance that ultimately led to the action of having his account closed was benchmarked with a strength score of 85 or in, in three-minute games. Interesting. This performance, which, as mentioned, Hans confirmed was attained via cheating, was within the range of strength scores obtained from Chess.com reports of various GMs. So it's a false negative, is what they're saying. We can't always detect it. He admitted he cheated, and we would not have known at all by our method. All these players, including Hans, admitted to cheating. Anonymous confessed GM, their ELO, strength score. So they probably just cheated in a few moves. Though notably, strength score is calculated differently from the accuracy score shared with a chess.com player when they review their games. In essence, strength score is based on actual statistical models and meant to be used across multiple games, while accuracy is a product-driven score meant for one game. Yeah, of course, I get it. You don't have to explain. I'm not stupid. So anyways, Hans is, what are his, what are his? Oh, here we go. None of these are high strength scores. Interesting. So what's the deal? Why am I I'm confused? Why are they explaining their method if it doesn't apply in this case? As an illustration, one notable case on the list above was a player in the FIDE Top 100 Players. This person competed in a single event comp uh, featuring 10 total games in 2020. Their strength score alone was not necessarily enough to act, but indicated that there was the potential for cheating. Even considering this player's ELO rating of nearly 2,700, our expert team was able to discern the truth that this player was indeed selectively cheating using a chess engine. When confronted with our allegations that they had used outside help, they confessed, as shown in the redacted email exchange. Wow! So they're just saying, like, we're good at this. Finally, OTB cheat detection has not to date been the primary focus of chess.com. Yeah, well, because you probably don't get paid for it. Does it go into exactly the methodology they use to calculate strength scores? No, no, I don't think it does. But it explains, like, in pretty, like, good detail, like, the general idea. Um, it, it, they're saying it's like a overall sort of description of the games, like over time in relation to like, yeah, how accurate the moves are, but like taking into account like multiple games, it sounds like, and sort of like getting a broader perspective on a user of their website. Hans's strength score is both lower and higher than a number of players that have confessed to cheating in the past. And we have successfully identified multiple players who have cheated despite having a relatively low strength score. For each of these cases, the strength score flagged suspicious performances and a dedicated move-by-move -move review by Chess.com's team of analysts and high-rated players concluded that cheating had occurred. It is important to note that every one of the players in Table 2, including Hans, was given the benefit of the doubt. Okay. It'd be cool if they addressed why they let Ma Maxime Delugi have, like, three, three attempts at account. Oh, man. Anything else we should glean from this? I think we got a pretty good amount of information from this. I mean, I mean, I don't necessarily want to go through his, like, DMs with fucking Danny Wrench. I mean, hey, Danny, where do I need to send the written statement? Acknowledge the offense and promise to never do it again. Okay. Well, that's kind of strange. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. What did we learn? So I'm going to probably uh, stop the stream and just uh, chill. <laughs>